This week on Let's Make It, we're going to show you how to attach an RFID reader to our previous project of code entry to have two factors letting people into your building coming up. Ting! The new way everyone is getting their cell service. No overage penalties, great rates, keep what you do not use, no contracts, and someone will actually pick up the phone when you need support. Use our link and get $25 off your first month's service or your new phone. Just go to tech-zen.tv slash ting to save $25. Welcome to episode 15 of Let's Make It. And this week we're going to kind of revive an old thing that we did and add some things to it, but in the process you're going to learn about RFID. Uh, so first I'll talk about what RFID is, and you're going to see right here I have these cards, and if you work somewhere that you have a badge to get in and out of, you probably are used to seeing like a picture printed on this or something like that. These are just blank cards, but these are RFID cards. And um, there's no mag stripe on them, so they're basically running you, uh, you get close to a reader of some kind, to let you in the door. If you wipe to get in your building or whatever at work, then this is not the same thing as the RFID. Basically, RFID is um, a wireless technology that uses the power of a radio basically to turn this little chip that's on here. And if you can't really see inside this necessarily, but if you could, you'd see a bunch of wires round or wound around and a tiny little chip that uh, when it gets to the RF signal, it's enough power to turn the little chip on and it transmits out its code. Now, uh, what we're going to do today is we're going to take one of these and we're going to write a program that provides access to uh, a, basically something as a door lock like we did before. So, um, I'm going to revive the project we did, I think it was episode uh, 13 or 12, where we did the keypad entry to get, do a lock. And I'm actually going to add to that project the ability to use this. So why would you want to use a keypad and a card? And uh, it's called two-factor. And the whole idea of two-factor is it's something you have and something you know. So you know your passcode. And if somebody else would give that passcode, they could go get in without you. But if you have this on you you all and your passcode, it's double the protection. So somebody could steal your card, but they don't know your password. So they have something, but they don't know something. So it's they're considered two-factor. If you do it on a computer, they call it two-factor authentication. It's just double the protection. Um, passcodes can change very regularly and you can keep the same card for a long time and you typically protect the card because it has your identity and everything on it. So um, it's something you have with the card and something you know in the pin, which is your passcode or your pin. So, um, but before we go there, we're going to talk a little bit about the RFID. Now this is a, a blank, example. it's an RFID card. Everything on here has a, a code assigned to it. They call it a tag ID. And I'm going to use a RFID reader from Parallax. Uh, you can go to Parallax.com and look up RFID reader. I'm using the blue one. It's a read-only uh, Parallax RFID reader. Uh, they do have a read-write one now. I think it's black. Um, this will not work with the black one, just so you know. So let me go ahead, and I'm going to pull off the reader real quick and um, go to the camera in the Arduino and show you what we have over there. Okay, so... Here we see our kind of Frankenstein project we had before. Here's the keypad right here. I got stuck on it here because it's flat. Here's our display. And this blue thing, which you can't see because it's way thin, is the RFID reader. I'm going to pull it out and show you what it looks like. Uh, trying to be careful pulling it out. There we go. So, um, by the way, I did pull out the, uh, the pin to the power to the USB. So this is the um, reader, and you see, I don't know if you can see it on the camera, let's see if I can get it. Oh, there you can see it. See the little winds of wire going around? This is basically the antenna. Now it's on both sides. See it's on this side as well, right there. And there's not much to the electronics part of it. Uh, a couple chips are here, and um, I don't know what the chips they are. I haven't really gone through. But basically the concept is it sends out a signal, a power signal, 
that powers up the card or whatever kind of tag you have. I'm going to show you our kind of tag here in a second. And the tag starts transmitting out its code, and this receives the code. And what it does is it sends it back to serial port. So you see there's four pins here, and the four pins are uh, five volts, ground, and enable pin, which basically says it's either going, it's, it's reading or not reading, and then the data, which is serial data. This particular card sends out serial data at 2400 baud, so it's very, very slow. Uh, compared to te today's technologies, but you're only sending out a few digits, so it's actually fairly quick and uh, it works well for that. This particular one was designed for Parallax, which is uh, by Grand and D Idea Studio. Um, I can't remember the guy's name. His last name is Grand, obviously. Um, but um, so it's basically real simple to use. And again, it just as it sees a card that gets close, like I see a card like this get get close, it will. Um, read the card and send you back the number. Now, the thing is, it keeps sending it as well, and you're gonna see it as, that can be an issue, which we deal with in our, our code. Uh, and you'll see that during the first demonstration of this, uh, because we actually have, the first program we're gonna look at is one that just reads the data and displays it to the screen. So let me plug this back in, and get power back everywhere here. All right, so, uh, I showed you these cards right here, these, kind of, these cards, and they're like blank white cards. You could print on them if you had a card printer. But I want to show you another kind of RFID tag, and that is this little plastic thing. Uh, it goes on a keychain. You see it's on my keychain. And I did this for another project, and I've actually used one of these before, these parallax cards, but I did it with a PIC chip to uh, turn off and on a sound system by uh, having a valid key like this. So you give anybody who's allowed to do it one of these, they can go in and turn it off or on and it, worked, it works very well. Uh, but this is also one you can stick on your keychain, and I'll show you this. I actually set this up in our demonstration for today as one of the valid keys. So, all right, so what I'm going to do is I'm gonna show you a little bit about what I ha have done. So I have this stack of cards, and I've taking, taken three of them, and hope they don't mind, but some of our other hosts on our shows, I use their names. So here's Dennis, and I've written on this sheet of sticky paper, which you can't really tell probably, but it's a sticky note, and this is Dennis. Let me go back to the other camera so you can actually see what I'm doing, so you kind of get an idea what's going to be going on. You can see on this white card, I have Dennis's name, and I've assigned him just a random number as a pin number, and you see I put it on the bottom here. In his case, it's 9876. And I've done the same thing with two other random numbers, one for John, right there, and one for Michelle. And we're gonna see how this works in the program later on, so I just wanna make sure you understand as we get in there if I don't forget to tell you about this part of it. But our first thing we're going to do, and it's running right now as we're sitting here, is we're going to look at what comes back from the card when the parallax sees it. So let me uh, reset this. And I don't know if you can see that when I reset that, but there's a little red light on the parallax read right here. Red means it's reading. Green means it's not. So I'm gonna go put a card close. And let me bring the camera in a little bit closer. So hopefully we can see this. Let me move all this down a little. Okay, you can't really see that very well. But what you're seeing is the code. So in this case, the code is 0F0296A uh, EEE. This is that particular card. It's not a card that I'm using, um, but it, that's the code that comes back when you're, every time you do this. So if you see on here, if I keep doing this, you see another one. You see another one. Actually, because it's better if I do this. No, not really. So if I get a way to get you to see the screen better. But uh, you can see it keeps reading the, the card, and any card I grab is going to do that. And what it's sending back is a car or a line feed, a 10 is line feed, yeah, the line feed, and then the code, and then line feed again. That's like the beginning and the ending of the code that comes back from the parallax reader. So you can always look for the 10 so you know it's starting the next um, number. So that's like the the... the what you call that, the delimiter. Uh, and it goes in between each. So 
Uh, in our code, you'll see how we actually use that to know when to start start reading again. Um, I will say that, that this reader seems to be a bit noisy. Sometimes you just get garbage out of it. Um, and I'm not quite sure why, and we had to deal with that in our code a little bit. Uh, and actually, I'm gonna give you three pieces of code today. I'm only gonna talk in detail about two of them, but the third one deals with it uh, the way I think it should be dealt with in the real world scenario versus my demonstration. So right there you see garbage come across. That was EC02 and a bunch of zeros, and there was no card close to it. It just picked it up. So um, it doesn't follow the right format either necessarily. So I just got garbage. Don't know why that is. Uh, I mean, I've had that in multiple environments now, so it's picking up something from somewhere. I just don't know, know what it is. So uh, let's go ahead and that, let's walk through this program real quick, and we'll show you what how this program works. This is like the basis of our other programs. All right, so what we're looking at here, and this is going to be on the show notes, uh, is the RF read RFID, and this really is a very simple uh one and you see I basically include the wire and look at crystal going you displaying it to the, scre the screen I could just as easily just done it to the serial port and probably would have made a little bit more sense um, I'm actually don't even need to define the num anymore so something I was doing before let me get rid of this so it's less confusing so I do look at crystal and define the LCD do a uh, set up and remember I said this thing uses 2400 baht very slow so I do a serial dot begin at 2400. I init the LCD, I turn the backlight on, I do clear screen, and again, I don't need this anymore. And then what I'm doing is I'm taking and setting pin mode two, which is connected to the enable pin. And I probably should go, I'll go over that again here in a little bit when I get to the next program. But I have pin two connected to the enable pin of the RFID reader. So I set it to output and I turn it low. Low makes the reader come on. Seems a little non-intuitive. High basically says that the reader is not reading. Low says it is. Um, but you set it to low and it turns it on. And then all we're going to do is we're going to sit here and we're going to loop and look for serial input. And that's all I'm doing. Every time I see a serial, something come in the serial port, I'm just printing it to the screen. So um, it's very, very simple. It just outputs exactly as what you know, a serial. And you'll see... If you look at the actual um, screen, you'll see those funny characters in there. In between, you see it's got more garbage since we switched away as well. Um, those funny characters are the, the line feeds. So uh, I actually think it's a line feed in the beginning character turn to the end or something like that. Um, something similar to that. But that's it for the program. And then you see clear screen, which I have down here. And let me just say, I've experimented with the clear screen for this LCD. And every time I do it, the LCD gets messed up. So I do not use the command for clear screen on this LCD. I don't know what it is, um, but I'm doing the you know, LCD dot command um, LCD underscore clear screen. And every time I do that, it just like locks it up or something and just does weird stuff to it. So I've been manually doing this printing to, do, to um, clear the screen. That's why you see that in there. I know it's not very efficient, but that's just the best way it works. All right, so that is this simple program. Let's go look at the uh, Arduino again, and I'm going to show you how I have things wired. Uh, just so you have a reference to how they're wired. So uh, we have the LCD and it, we're using an Arduino Uno. So with the uh, two wire LCD, I have you know power running over to this bus. I have this whole breadboard bus powered uh, from the top down. And then I have the clocking and data going to uh, what is analog four and five. And that's where the um, the, that works on the UNO boards. And then over here on the right, you see I have this mess of cables right here, little plugs, and this is all for the pad, number pad right here. So it's the same wiring as we did in the previous show, uh, same pins and everything. So you can go back and look at that show if you want to know how it's wired, wired up. And then down here at the bottom, I have on pin one, uh, this yellow wire, which is the serial input from the RFID. And then on pin two, I have this white wire right here, and it goes to the enable pin. Let me bring this down. There, the enable pin on the RFID, you can barely see it because it's right above the camera, but um, there is an enable pin, and that, that's how I control that pin two, is through that enable pin. All right, so that's how it's wired. So now I'm going to go 
push this up a little bit. See the screen a little bit better. Um, and get our pad down here, because we're going to need the pad. And I want to walk through, I'm going to load the other program in, and let me just say, with, uh, I had trouble getting this to work with um, the Leonardo, and I think it's because the way the serial port works on the Leonardo, it wasn't ever seeing the serial data from the RFID. That is what I started with was Leonardo, and I went through a bunch of different iterations and just couldn't get it to work. So I said, well, knowing that the Leonardo has the the USB serial back and everything, let me just try a different one and see if that's the problem. And that was obviously the problem because it worked right the first time. So um, I may go back at some other time and try to figure that out, but I may not use as well either. So let me go ahead. But the, what, what I was trying to get to was to upload to the Arduino, you have to unplug the serial plug from the RFID. So let me pull this out. And then I'm going to upload a different program. And let's see. It's uploading. And it's done. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm also going to enable my serial monitor. And the other thing I'm going to say is that uh, you'll see this go off and back on again. And that is because I'm very close to using the maximum amount of power <laughs> from the USB to power both the LCD and the um, RFID when they're both on. All right, so we're going to do a demonstration here. And right now you see on the screen, it's saying, let's make it two-factor auth project scan tag. Well, I don't know why I can't see this so good today. All right, so scan tag. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take, here is John. And you see his code is 1245. So I'm going to scan the tag. And you see it says, welcome John, please enter your secret code. So I'm going to enter one, two, four, five. Access granted, welcome. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to put an invalid code in. Here's the same one, John. There's John, and I'm gonna start with five. Access denied. So this is working very similar to we have what we had before, with the exception of I have to scan the badge first. So John is one, two, four, five. Let's take another one. Here's Dennis. And Dennis is nine, eight, seven, six. So I'm going to do Dennis. And I'm going to put in John's code. Oh, it's invalid. So you can see that the code is not fixed. It's based on the actual uh, card itself. So again, 9876 is Dennis. So I'm going to scan Dennis. Hold on one second. Invalid card. So what we're going to talk about, it probably just got garbage. You saw it said invalid card. It probably got some of that garbage. Uh, and it displayed invalid card because it couldn't find a match for the card. So here we go. Dennis again. Dennis. Oops. Hang on. Did it again. It's faster than I am. There. Okay. There's Dennis. And 9876, 9876. Okay, access granted. Now, here's an improvement over the last program that we did. The last program, if you start entering a code and stopped, it would never time out. It would just sit there and wait. So if you started entering a code and walked away and somebody else comes to enter the code, it would not work. You had to, you know, it would say it's invalid after two key presses. This one's been changed, so let me just scan Dennis. I'm just going to take it 10 seconds. So there's Dennis. I'm not going to touch the keypad. And it's sitting here waiting for the secret code. And after 10 seconds, it says code entry timeout. So I'm going to enter a partial code. So I'm going to use Dennis again here, Dennis. And I'm going to enter, what was it, 9, 8, and I'm going to stop. I forgot what I was doing. I was going to walk away or call it away, something like that. And 
you just don't want to sit here because it's going to be waiting for Dennis to enter a code. Two digits in, you're pretty good chance, better chance of getting it. So time, code entry timeout at this point. And we'll do the other one here. This is Michelle, and it's 2580. So we're going to go Michelle, and then 2580. So I'll grant it. Now, I mentioned before about a different kind of tag. And I'm going to use this one. This is mine that I use uh, for other things, but it works fine with this. Uh, let me go ahead and scan it, and I created a code of one, two, three, four with for this one. So I'm going to come down. All right, there's me. One, two, three, four. Okay, I was granted. And just to show how this all is still working as expected, I'm going to go ahead and scan this again. And invalid code. And. We'll do a timeout. I'm just going to put in, I'll just put in a one, that's good enough. And in 10 seconds, it'll timeout. Code entry timeout. Okay, so now I have these other cards that are not programmed into the program, so it should come up invalid. It did, invalid card. So what you were noticing before was that invalid card was you saw it getting garbage and it does that from time to time. So see scanning tag and you'll see here and you'll occasionally see it's a uh, invalid tag. All right, so that's how it's supposed to work. Um, and I'm going to show you another program then that makes this a little bit more probably real world because you typically wouldn't want this turned on all the time and stuff like that. But I'll explain that when I, when I actually get to it. But let's go look at the output of the serial report now. So the other thing that's happening, and you had the serial report uh, in monitor mode, and you see right here 2400 baud, very important, because it is at 2400 baud. But you can see as I was going through, I'm logging access granted, access denied, to what location and who, uh, who tried to do it. So you can see right here, uh, deny, granted, 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 and then I was denied because I put the wrong code in. And so this is like, if you could take a serial printer and attach to the Arduino, it would log everything that's going on on the lock or the entry system or whatever you're, you want to use it for. All right, so let's hop over here. I'm going to take this off to the side and look at this program. This is a lot more complicated than the last one we looked at. So let's go on down here. And the one thing I didn't hook back up from the other example was the green and the red LEDs, although they are still working. So if you would look at the other uh, episode, you would um, see how to wire up the LEDs and these are, are still working. I basically took the other uh, program and just pretty much added to it for the most part. So if you want to hook up a green and red LED, you do that on pins 12 and 13. And here I define the RFID enable pin as pin two, the same as the other project we were looking at just so it was easy to, to uh, upload code. And now here's where I define the actual employee information. So I have number of employees is four. And I have, these are the tag IDs of the card. So if we take a card and you scan it with the other program, it gives you the code back. So this is my little thing that's on my keychain. You see it's a different, completely different address than what the other ones are. And then it's uh, the first name, the last name, and then the secret code. So here you see the four employees, Mike, Dennis, Michelle, and John. And actually I spelled his name wrong. Let me fix that. Um, so you see their badge ID or the tag ID when you scan it, first name, last name, and the secret code, which is what I wrote on the tags as a demonstration. Now, we're using a couple other things we've talked about in, that, uh, in previous shows, one of them being state tables. So what we're doing is we basically have two states. The first state is we're waiting for a card to be read, and the second state is waiting for a code to be entered. So I define current state, and I default to waiting for tag ID, and then I define the constants of waiting for tag ID and waiting for passcode so that they're easy to reference later on in the, um, in the code. Then we come down to miscellaneous global variables. And uh, I have our code, use the store secret code of the 
RFID that was read. So basically when we read the card, we set our code equal to the secret code of the person. And then these are all used, remember, of the code input. Uh, this is used when we read the card. Um, this is the tag ID that when we read it. So these are just variables that are used throughout the, the program that are, are global for the most part uh, because of the way it's working. Uh, the bytes that we've read in, uh, that's part of the code read. The current employee, when we find an employee that matches, we set those variables so we can refer to them later on. And this is the, the, our timer variable for using the code entry timeout. Then we define the location name. This is just, only thing it does, it prints out on the serial port where they're trying to get into. So if you were printing, you had multiple of these and you're trying to print out to a printer, um, you could go look at the documentation you can see where they're trying to get into uh, based on the log. Then we define the key pad like we did in the previous show and the row and pins as in the previous show. And keypad, again, if you want to know how to use the keypad in a little more detail, go to the previous episode. We talk more about that. We define our LCD, and then we do our LCD init, and you see a couple of delays in here. I've been experimenting with this particular LCD. It's a little flaky sometimes, so I was trying to put delays in here. Your LCD may not require that. In fact, you see I, you know, I knitted it twice, which seemed like it helped it some as well. I don't know why. Uh, but continuing, uh, serial begin, we start the serial port at 2400 uh, baud, so it's the, uh, it's the RFI reader ID. We define the RFID enable pin uh, as output, which is pin two. And then we're doing the uh, green and red LEDs here, uh, output, and we are turning them both off. And then we display the screen that says scan your tag, and we're done with the setup. Okay, so now we're getting into the loop area. And this is what's continually happening. So. You see when we enter in, we have a couple of local variables, L, which is a looping variable, and employee ID, which is the temporary employee ID as we're working through things. And then we get into our state table. Based on current state, we're going to say, if we're waiting for tag ID, we want to make sure that the pin is low on the RFID reader. And um, may I come back into me? You can see that if I get it into the camera, how that was actually working. But this turns it into read mode because we're now waiting for an RFID tag. And we look for serial data. And as we find serial data, we're going to continue to read. Um, if we see a header or what is a uh, line feed, we say go back to zero because that's the first character in the data. So we set it back to zero. And we, then we start reading data as long as it's available. And if we, we drop out of this while loop, if we see another uh, line feed or a carriage term, meaning it's the end of the, the reading, or we get to 10 digits, whichever one happens first. And as we're doing this, we're basically storing into this code variable the what we are reading in from the serial port from the reader. And if we get down to the bottom here, and it's equal to 10, so if it's not equal to 10, basically it's garbage, uh, is what that's basically saying. Um, but if it's equal to 10, we basically want to null it at the end because we're going to do some, some string compares later on. Uh, we want to make sure it doesn't uh, continue on in the memory space. So we add a null to the end of it. And then we call this routine called get employee, and which returns the employee ID, which basically is the uh, array element number of the employee that matched. Now, if none matches, it returns negative one saying nothing matched. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to say, if it's negative one, it's not a valid person. So we want, we're basically going to turn off the RFID reader, display the invalid card for five seconds or 10 seconds, or whatever it's set up for in this routine. We'll go back and look at that then. We'll get down to the bottom. And then we're going to turn the reader back on again, and we go back and start all over again. However, if the employee is valid, we're going to store the employee ID for later use. We're going to display the screen that, sa that says, welcome in the name, enter your passcode, we're going to change the state table to say we're waiting for a passcode, and we're going to set the secret code to the employee's secret code, clear any data that's on the serial port, and then we're going to set our timer for a key keypad input. So we go down and we set, then at the end of all this, we, no matter what we do, we set byte read back to zero. So next time we get code from the serial port, we're back putting it into the uh, location of zero. And that's it for and reading in the RFID. So that's the state of, that's what we do while we're in the state of waiting for tag ID. 
Now, when we go into the state waiting for passcode, because we've got a valid card, we're going to disable the RFID reader. So you see the light on the RFID reader go green, and I'll try to show you that to you a little bit later. And then we get into our previous code that we had about entering in keys. So there's a couple of things that we've added in here, uh, and I'll kind of walk through it. So we say we get a key from the keypad, and if the key is not zero, which means the key is pressed, we want to reset the timer because the key was pressed. So my timer is equal to the current number of milliseconds since the Arduino booted. We're going to clear out the old asterisk data, and we're going to re-display it with the number of characters that are currently been entered. And then we're going to check and see if the key that was pressed matches the next value of our secret code. And, and if it does, then we're going to increase the position unless it's equal to four, which means we've got a valid code the whole way through. At that point, we're going to do unlock door, reset our current position back to zero, and we're going to go back to waiting for the tag ID. And then before we get back into that, we're going to clear any extra data that came into the serial port while we were in this state because it could get garbage. So we just want to clear it all out. If it does not match and the code's invalid, we are basically going to, well, one thing you mentioned here is a log employee. I skipped over that. We'll show you later on, but basically that's what's printing to the serial report, log employee. So you see current employee and then true means that they were um, allowed to have access to it. So when we get down here and denied, we log the employee and denied access. Display the invalid code screen, set position back to zero, go back to waiting for tag because we'd only want them to if the code's invalid, we want them to go back and re-tag re it again. So we want them to run another tag, and then we clear out any garbage that's on the serial report. Now, if there is no key, so up here we turn this if statement, if key is not equal to zero, I mean, a key was pressed, so we do what we just walked through. But if the key is not pressed, I'm going to come down here, and I'm going to say I'm going to add 10,000 milliseconds, or 10 seconds, to where I was the last time I set my timer, and if that is less than or equal to the current number of milliseconds, then they didn't enter anything for 10 seconds. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show the code entry timeout window or just screen, start all over with code entry, change the state back waiting for tag and clear out any garbage. And then we come down here and let's look at the get employee. It's actually very simple. Uh, we define our, um, our loop variable, which actually this stuff doesn't even need to be here anymore. If this makes it less confusing, which I'm sure it does. Let me get rid of a couple of these commented out items. So basically what we're doing is we're going to loop through, setting our loop variable equal to zero, and while our loop variable is less than the number of employees, which is four, and at the, after each loop, we're going to increment the loop var variable by one. And then we do a string compare. The tag ID is what we just read. It's passed in uh, whenever we read a tag. So I'm going to compare that to the employee, the loop variable, and the very first element, which was the tag ID. And if they're equal, it's going to equal zero. So that means I want to return where L was. So I return to you what the, uh, I won't call it employee number, but basically it's an element ID. Uh, and if I go through all this loop, all this stuff, and nothing matches, I'm going to return you negative one. So that means I, I walk through all the employees, and what you sent me doesn't match any employee at this point. So if you go back up and look at get employee, where it's at, it's right here. I'm sending the code that we read to in the employee ID, and then here's where I look for negative one. Negative one means it's invalid card, so not an employee with that card ID, basically. Okay, so the other new one is log employee. And basically, this is very simple. Uh, it's, it basically prints the serial port, either access grant or access denied, depending on what this granted access variable is set to, and two in the location name. So in our case, it was, let me see. It was right here. It was two, and I said, let's make it Studio A. So that variable is coming from the very top. We define it at the very top. If we scroll to the top and we scroll down a little bit and right here, location name. Let's make it studio. You can make it anything you wanted. Um, so let's scroll down a little bit. 
and go back into where we were. So I'm basically saying access granted or access denied to the location name we just defined for, and then the employee's first name, a space, the employee's last name, and then two blank lines. Now, I could have done this as a S print F, and that would have taken the two in location name into one line and the four uh, employee and name into one line, and it probably would have simplified things. But we haven't really talked about S print F yet, so I decided not to do that. This was kind of like the quick, dirty way of doing it. All right, so here's another new one. We're going to clear our serial report, and it's actually very simple. Um, all of this does is it, while there's data on the serial report, it reads it and basically throws it in the trash. It just reads it and doesn't do anything with it. So it keeps reading until there's no more data, which effectively clears out all input on the serial report. So we do this quite often, and the main reason we do that is because of the garbage that we're getting from the um, the thing. In fact, actually, actually, while I'm sitting here doing this, I'm seeing it saying access denied uh, because of uh, invalid card or whatever um, on the right over here on the side. So it's sitting here doing it while I'm sitting here doing this. But there you see invalid card. We just did that. Um, unlock doors the same as we had in the other project. All this stuff was um, copied from the other project. With the exception here is code entry. And all it is is another output saying code entry timeout. And we just display this when we timeout. And then here is the tag screen, and then the code entry, secret code, and then here's our clear screen, which basically bunks out each line because clear screen doesn't work right. All right, so that's the quick walkthrough of this program. Um, this will all be on the show notes. And I want to talk to you in a couple minutes about another version of this program. I'm actually going to show it to you um, so you can see uh, how I think it probably would be more in the real world uh, compared to what this one is. So, um, but for now, I need to tell you a little bit about uh, one of our sponsors. We have a new sponsor on the show, and it's Ting. Uh, you probably saw that in the very beginning of the billboard in the beginning. And uh, Ting is the new a new kind of mobile phone company. Um, they're really, really awesome. Um, no contracts, so you can like sign up and quit anytime that you want. Add new phones. You can add a new phone to your plan for as little as six dollars a month, uh, and all the minutes and everything are shared. Uh, it's a great service. Uh, we've been evaluating some of our services now, and looking at Ting is is the the way um, to do it. Let me go over here and show you uh, why Ting is so great. Uh, first of all, they're great rate. Their rates are awesome. Like I said, six dollars a month for a, a phone, um, and you you only pay for what you use. So, and there's no overage penalty. So, say you you wanted 300 minutes a month, and for some reason this month you've used your phone, and you've gone up to 600 minutes or something like, like that. There is no fee. There's no fine for that, and there shouldn't be a fine for that. Um, it's it's your phone. You shouldn't be fined for going over that. They basically just jump you up to the next level. Um, and without any penalty. And then next month, they bring it back down again. So you basically pay for what you use. And on the months that you do not use, say you bought 600 minutes and you've only been using 300 minutes or less, they'll drop you down to the 300-minute plan. And um, so it's like you only are truly paying for what you use. Uh, all device, multiple devices on one plan. I mean, you you share the data, you share the minutes, you share the texting between all your phones. Uh, it's a great thing for small businesses. There are no fees or limits on usage at all. A ton of free features, everything you would expect, uh, and even some that you wouldn't expect that other big carriers don't do. Tethering and hotspotting is all included uh, with um, your Ting. And again, no contract. So. You know, there's none of this, you, you want to get out like a couple months earlier, go to another carrier or whatever. Um, there's no, no contract, so there's no penalty to get, you know, to move to another company. Uh, you can add devices on. Um, think about uh, devices like, you know, maybe your your mother doesn't like cell phones, doesn't carry one, but you like to have her one in her car because she ever breaks down somewhere. You can get her one for six bucks a month, stick it in a glove box and say, here's the phone if you ever need it for an emergency. Uh, for six bucks, that's like that's that's cheap for um, peace of mind and stuff like that. So, uh, yeah, very very good. Um, you can bring your own devices. They're uh, expanding this. They basically run on the Sprint network. So if your phone works on the Sprint network, you will have no problem uh, bringing your own devices. They have uh, very expensive phones to buy as well. 
Um, they have uh, geek powered customer support. So when you call somebody, they're they're not like uh, calling the other carriers where they're just somebody off the street that has a script in front of them. These are people are not to mention that oh, they're not only are they smart and they know the products and they cover everything. They don't put you on hold between 8 a.m. and 8 p.m. They will not put you on hold. In fact, if you call, the phone will ring until something picks you up, and you will have that person until the end. There is no such thing as a hold with Ting. And that person's very empowered. It isn't to go talk to my supervisor. They can take care of you on the spot, no problem. And you know, if you ever worked with Two Cows or uh, Hover or any of those people, that this is a Two Cows company, that their support is just awesome. I mean, this is the, the Hover support is just as good as the Ting support. So this is their whole thing. They're a support-oriented company. Uh, they're very, they much, very much speak Android. Uh, I don't ever see a mention of iPhones uh, that could be coming soon. I don't know. Never really asked them, but they got great uh, graphs, easy to read bills. Uh, like I said, there is no contract. Um, let's go look at the rates. I mean, the rates are just amazing. Let's see plans. So let's see. Here's a here's a calculator. Say you do 500 minutes a month. And if you don't, maybe you do 100 text messages. So you're not a big text message person. And uh, let's just say maybe 500 megabytes. So right there is uh, $31 a month. And then it would be uh, each phone's an additional $9. So, yeah, it's it's crazy how, how cheap things are. In fact, in the case of the emergency phones, you would probably be actually down to $6 a month. Because you wouldn't have any minutes on an emergency phone. If you knew the month that you used it, if it was less than 100 minutes, $9 a month. What kind of, and that's just like amazing, amazing. So you can hear here, you see how many devices you want. So let's say you have uh, you, your wife, and two kids. So there's four phones. We'll go back up to 500 minutes, uh, a gigabyte. I'm sorry, that's text messages. Uh, well, kids these days, you know, it's up to you to control them. <laughs> Let's say uh, a gigabyte, a thousand megabytes right there. So $62 a month for four phones on the plan. It's, that's just nuts. So, yeah. And, and we talked about devices. You own the device here. There's none of this sending it back. There's no surcharges. So you can see right here, you know, buy the phones. These are uh, all good phones. Here's an S3 right here, but the phone is yours. I mean, there is no contract with this. Like I said, leave, take the device with you whenever you want. Uh, here's some feature phones. You can you have data. Here's the data. It's awesome. So what we worked out with Ting is if you go to techdesen.tv slash Ting, they will actually give you $25 off. Uh, that's our newest sponsor, and we love having them as a sponsor. Um, they're they're great. They are basically again they're two cows. Hover, uh, we use Hover here uh, for stuff, and the support's just the same. Uh, and that's just awesome. I mean, they're a really great company to work with. Plus, they're on the Sprint network, so Sprint networks you know growing like crazy. So anywhere you have Sprint, uh, and there's good coverage maps on there on there as well, and they're just, they're everywhere. So, all right, that's Ting. And so now I want to get back over to the another program which is basically the same one we just walked through but probably more of a real world scenario because you wouldn't want the LED, the backlight led to be on all the time um for, for a couple of reasons first of all it's not very power efficient um it's probably where's i know they're led backlit but uh or maybe they're not led backlit whatever the backlight is going to probably go bad in time um, if you have somebody who's looking to get into your building you don't want to show them where the card reader is at you don't want to make, make it obvious i mean they're going to be looking for it anyways but um, that just makes it even more obvious, uh, and it's telling them what to do as well. So you could uh, put just the display and the pad out there and the reader, you know, somewhere close to it, uh, but it, there's no reason to have the display turned on. The other thing is if somebody gets a card, like one of these cards that's, that's invalid, you would want to tell them that you can read the card because I will tell you, like, um, other cards that I have and other RFID things do not work with this. So if you tell them the card's invalid, that tells them that, it can read the card so you know what kind of system that it is. Where my other cards don't give any data at all. It is nothing. So you wouldn't want to tell them that, yeah, the card is readable by us because that way they could take, figure out what the technology is and, and gives you an extra step. If somebody really wants to get in, it's some of the things they're going to look for. 
So what I've done, and I'm gonna go load it up here really quick. Um, all right, there we go. And I need to unplug the Arduino. Or not the Arduino, but the, uh, the serial port on the Arduino, just because I need to upload this. So I'm calling this, in, this one the two-factor real-life example. And it's uploading, all right, it's done. So let me plug this in. And let me go turn on the serial port. And basically, in simple terms, it's actually less of a program than what the program is we just did. Now let me go switch over to the Arduino. And I have a card here. Here's John. You see the display is blank right now. Mine ain't turned on. So I'm going to take and I'm going to scan John. And it says, welcome, John. Uh, please enter your secret code. Of course, John's secret code is 1245. So let's do this. It's 1245. Access granted. And then we go back to sleep when we're done. So it's turned off. So we're going to do a timeout thing. It's going to scan John. There's John. And he'll time out in 10 seconds and then they'll go dark again. Go to free timeout. And then when it's done with this, we clear the screen and go blank. So here's a card that's not valid. It's not registered. And in the old system, we would tell you it was not registered. See, nobody can tell. So even if this was a former employee who lost their card or as an employee card has disabled and lost it or whatever, somebody couldn't grab this and go check to see if it worked with you or not. And they wouldn't be able to tell what technology you're using because there's different kinds of RFID. And I'm not quite sure which type this, this one's using. I should have looked up before I got on the show, um, but I didn't. So again, you can see it's not working. So let me grab my keys. So here's my RFID and I'm going to scan it. All right, there it is. Welcome, Mike. And I will put in an invalid code. Invalid. And it goes to sleep, just like that. So let's go take a look at the computer here. And you'll see I have uh, access granted for John, and then I was denied once to put an invalid code. But if you look at this program, it is basically the same thing we had before with a few exceptions. Um, one of the things that's different is you'll notice we commented out the LCD backlight. So the light does not come on by default. And then when we get in, when we get into um, these states, while we're waiting for tag to be swiped, we say LCD, no backlight, so it turns off. And when we're in the state of looking for a code, we turn the backlight back on again. And the other thing that we did is when we get an invalid code or an invalid um, tag ID, we just clear the serial port, assuming it's garbage. We don't tell them it's invalid um, because then they would know that we actually could read it. And we just continue on. So it looks to them like nothing's actually happening. So this is probably the more secure. Uh, and because we did that, there's a few things at the bottom down here we actually got rid of. Um, we did not need... Well, we need invalid code. We still need uh, unlock door, code entry timeout, code entry screen. Um, so there was something in here. It was um, the dis wait for tag or something like that. I can't remember which one it was. Um, let's see. I can scroll down here and look real quick. So we just didn't need them anymore. So you'll see anywhere that was in use, it was pulled out. Invalid code, invalid card wasn't needed anymore. So we just took that out. And then there was code, no, display tag screen, the scan tag one. We got rid of that too. And all we, basically all we do with that is we just do a clear screen in its place. It's because we don't want anything there at all. So we took that stuff out. We added in um, the on and off for the, uh, the backlight. And uh, that's pretty much it. I mean, that made it a lot more secure in itself uh, and a little bit more, probably more to real life on how real life stuff would work uh, like this. So 
that is pretty much it for this episode of Let's Make It. Uh, and as some of you probably know, I was actually not here next week. Uh, last week, I was actually on a cruise uh, in the Caribbean. And uh, when I left, it was winter, and when I came back, it's summer. Today is supposed to be 90, um, but I'm still not quite with it. That's why I'm running a little bit late on this show. Uh, and plus, I ran into some problems with the Arduino, and I was tired and couldn't figure it out. And, you know, how I just get back from vacation, the vacation from the vacation. So, but that's it for this week, episode 15. Uh, I do encourage you, to, if you're watching this on YouTube, to give us a thumbs up and subscribe. Uh, and then uh, also do a share and share with your friends that are interested in this kind of stuff because we like to get this community growing as much as possible. Um, I've had some emails while I was gone, so if you send me an email, I will get back to you this week. Um, uh, some of them, I don't remember what they all were, but we're working with somebody also on a show probably hopefully next week on shift registers. Uh, maybe try to get him on the show with us. I haven't talked to him about that yet, uh, but that's a possibility. If you uh, get this show uh, through automatic download or if, you, or if you're watching it on a podcast, you know, go to iTunes and subscribe so you get it automatically. But if you're getting it through iTunes, I do ask that you put in a, uh, a comment because it helps us get found. Um, so many things these days are based on comments and ratings. And when you're starting a new show, it's so hard to um, get it started because it's hard to get found uh, with all the other shows and all the other noise that's out there. Um, good or bad. Uh, but yeah, if you're getting it through iTunes, definitely would appreciate if you go out and uh, give us a, a comment and a rating. Um, same way uh, with YouTube as well. Uh, that's great if you can uh, do that too. Uh, if you're getting us on Stitcher or something like that, they all do the same thing. We're available on Roku now. Uh, if you go to techzen.tv, you can go to the show notes, see all the show notes for all of our shows, so see all the other shows as well, uh, um, and all the other episodes of this show that we just talked about when we did some of this stuff previously. So um, definitely a good place to go. Plus you got our social information out there. You can follow us on Twitter. So you see when a new show goes up, all that stuff. We have all, we're very social. We're trying to be very social at least. Um, but it's all out there on the techsend.tv slash let's make it, or you can go to let's make it.tv, either one. They're the same, same thing. And uh, we definitely appreciate anything you can do to help us get the word out about us because it's, uh, it's a growing community, but we like it to grow just a little bit quicker. Uh, and we definitely would appreciate your input on what you want us to do in the future. And if you've done a project and would like to send us some videos on it, we definitely would appreciate that too. We, you know, but just show it up on here and uh, maybe even get you on the on the air with us and talk about your project sometimes, uh, sometime as well. Um, that's what's coming up with the shift registers. Somebody said they dealt with shift registers, and uh, we haven't discussed that. And it's a, a neat a neat thing to learn. So we're going to so what we're doing with that is it came from one of our our, our viewers. And uh, we definitely appreciate uh, all that uh, feedback. All right, that's it for this week. We will see you next week on Let's Make It. For show notes for this show, contacts, and more, go to the techzen.tv website where you can get show notes for all of our shows. We love to hear from our viewers and listeners. We have an email, a Twitter, and a phone number where you can contact us for each show. For details, visit the techzen.tv website and get the show details. You can also make a video and upload it somewhere like YouTube or Vimeo and then just send us a link. You never know, you may see your video in a future show. You can get all of our shows delivered automatically to your favorite device by going to your favorite podcast website like iTunes and subscribing. Each of our shows also has a YouTube channel you can subscribe to to get regular updates. Our shows are also available on most internet radio networks like Stitcher and TuneIn Radio. You can also watch and listen to our shows on Xbox, TiVo, and Roku. You can even find us on your Zoom.